Happy Sabbath, everybody. It is a joy to be here. It's good to see you uh, here today. And uh, truly delighted because uh, God is good. And I'm encouraged to see all of you here, right? I think we're just going to see like a few people. But you guys have showed up because you don't know, want to experience God. And, and, and you're here to worship the Lord. And for that, I'm, I'm grateful. Amen? Amen and amen. So um, if you remember in March, we were in a series called Disruptive Living. Anybody remember that? Okay, a few of you. All right. But we are coming back to that idea, but we are focusing on the concept of a disruptive God. Everybody say disruptive God. And I feel like, Elder, in this season, there's been a disruption, you know what I mean? Uh, And of course, you have many thoughts about it, and I'm not here to speak on that specifically, but I feel like this moment of disruption has actually propelled a lot of you to reignite faith you know, to say, I want to serve the Lord, right? So I feel like there's been something positive out of this disruption that we have experienced as a church. And I think we can praise God for that, right? And really, that's the idea that we want to communicate in your life, that sometimes God puts you through disruptions because He knows that the disruption is going to be an elevation to the level that you're supposed to reach. Otherwise, if things remain the same, you are never going to elevate or actually go up to the level God wants you to go. Amen, somebody? Right? So if you have your Bibles, I want to spend a little bit of time, a lot of time, a little bit of time, in uh, Jeremiah. And uh, we are looking at Jeremiah chapter 12. And uh, beginning in verse number 1 until verse number, number 6, Jeremiah chapter 1, chapter 12 rather, Chapter 12, verses 1 to 6. I'm a little bit nervous. It's been a long time, right? So can you pray for me? (laughs) I've been preaching a long time, so I'm I'm nervous a little bit, right? Uh, Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 1. If you got to say amen. Amen. All right. This is what it says. Righteous righteous are you, O Lord. In fact, that's a whole sermon right there. Jeremiah says, God, you are righteous. When I plead with you. In other words, every time I I ask you to handle my situation, Lord, I know you're always going to be fair. You're never going to mistreat me. You're never going to put me down. You are righteous every time I bring a case to you. Let me read. But (laughs) let me talk to you about your judgments. This is a little tension right here, Pastor, because Jeremiah recognizes that God is righteous, but he is struggling with a particular character of God. He says, you're righteous, God, but I'm struggling with your justice. And I know there's somebody here who you love the mercy of God, but you struggle with his justice. You, 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 you love the fact that Jesus died, but you struggle with the fact that God will judge people and he killed people in the Old Testament. That's the struggle of Jeremiah here. Now, let me read. I'm going to preach later. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those happy who deal treacherously? You, God, have planted them. Yes, they have taken root. They grow, yes, they bear fruit because of you. But look, God, you have blessed them, but they they, 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 they are far from you. They are far from your mind. Verse 3, but you, know all, but, but you, Lord, know me. You have seen me. You have tested my heart toward you. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter. How long will the land mourn and the, the, the herbs of every field wither? Beasts and birds are consumed for the wickedness of those who dwell there because they said he will not see our final end. Verse 5 and 6, the last verses. If you run with the footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with the horses? <laughs> That's where the title came from. And if in the land of peace in which you have trusted they wearied you, then will you do in the floodplain of the Jordan? Verse 6, the last one. For even your brothers, the house of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. Yes, they have called a multitude after you. Do not believe them even though they speak smooth words to you. Let's pray. Let's pray. Mighty God, do what you do so that I can do what I can to the honor, of your, to the honor and glory of your name. 
Speak to somebody who needs you this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> when I was growing up, I used to pretend that I was Jet Li, Bruce Lee, and Jackie Chan. So I would watch their movies and go outside and practice kicks. Ha, ha, ha. I was training myself. But any time I got into a fight, I forgot the kicks. <laughs> I was just like this. <laughs> because knowing something doesn't mean you can use it effectively. In other words, being informed doesn't mean you're transformed. You can know a lot of things, but in the heat of the battle, fail to use the knowledge that you have. And that is why today it still boggles my mind we have overweight doctors. I'm not picking on anybody, please. I'm not picking on anybody. But here's somebody who knows the human body, but they, they smoke and, and, and they stay up late at night. They don't take care of themselves. They have the knowledge. We have pastors who sometimes struggle to believe in God who they preach. And if you talk to many pastors, hey. <laughs> You discover that as much as they preach to you and talk to you about Jesus, they also have their own struggles. I'm number one right there. We have mothers who have kids, who love kids, but don't really know how to be a mother, don't know how to be a parent. So it tells me that sometimes you, you, you can know a lot of things, and people may, 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 may think of you as educated. You may have a PhD. You may have a master's. You, you may have all the certifications. You may have gone places, but in reality, you don't know how to apply and use the knowledge that you have. I was asking myself, why is that so? How can you know a lot and not be able to do a lot? How can you know a lot and still struggle to live a, a productive life? How can you know a lot about accounting and help your company to be profitable, but you are living hand to mouth. I asked myself that. And this is what I discovered. Many of us are like tiramisu cake. I don't eat it, but many of you do. <laughs> uh -huh. It has levels and layers. And what I discovered is that sometimes when information enters our brain, it sticks there, but there are layers of perceptions. There are layers of a background. There are layers of abuse. There are layers of trauma. There are layers of this is how I always want to do it. And so sometimes the information comes and it meets a wall of concrete and it's not actually able to penetrate in us. And therefore, we always revert back to the very same things that we're used to. Am I preaching or am I not preaching? We have different backgrounds, different perceptions. And right here, some of you are from Manado, some of you are from Sumatra, some of you are from Jawa, some of you are from Bali, all of us different. And that, that's why you're struggling today, even though you know you're supposed to sleep well, even though you know you're supposed to eat well, even though you're, supp you're supposed to take care of your money. There are layers that you have not dealt with yet, and unless you dealt, deal with those layers, you cannot actually progress as you should, as, as you should, you should progress. Slow down, Pastor. <laughs> Preach to your people. Talk to them. And I believe that this is the disruption that God wants to do in our lives, to shake us up. Break the concrete so that the truth may actually penetrate and have a root in us and we don't remain the same but are actually transformed. Many of us, check this, are saturated with great ideas about God. But when the struggle comes, those ideas about God do not actually sustain us in the difficulty. In other words, we may believe that God is loving, but when we commit a sin against God, we will believe that he doesn't love us anymore, though we know that he loves us. In other words, we may believe that God can forgive us of our sins, but because in our heart, in our system, in our psyche, we have believed that we have to get on our knees like Martin Luther and climb up the steps in, in the dead of winter to, to beg God, please, I'll make it right, God. That sometimes in the crisis, the very same things that we know don't sustain us. But we believe in Jesus. He's coming again. We love God. 
True story. One of my professors, he lost a son. It was a bad, bad, bad situation. So we are praying for him. And the son died. And I've been this pastor. I've been his professor. He believes that when you die, you go to the grave waiting for the second coming of Jesus to come. His son is dead. But he called a magician to pray over his son and lay over his son so that the son can come back to life. Telling me that just because you believe and just because you're here, when you're in a difficulty, you may not act according to the beliefs that you have. And here is a struggle that Jeremiah is facing in this particular story because he's saying, God, you are righteous, but I have a problem with your justice. I get that you're kind, but, but I'm really struggling to make sense of why you do the things that you do. So Jeremiah is trying to make sense. Yeah, God is fair. But how come he's so fair, but the wicked are prospering? How come he's so fair? I'm, I'm not making it, but those who don't believe in God, they don't serve God, they're the ones going up the ladder. Don't you ask yourself the same question? Hmm? When you pass over the promotion at work, you've been busting your behind, coming in early, putting in the hours, but the son, the son of the boss, he climbs over you, and you're like, God, come on, where are you at? Don't you ask the same question when in your family it's always your brother or your sister who always gets uh, the favorite treatment from the parents, they get the best vacations, they get the best gifts, but you're always the one struggling to earn love of your parents. Don't you ask yourself the question, I'm a good guy, I don't cheat on nobody, but why are the girls never <laughs> coming to me? This is the struggle of Jeremiah. And what he taught me is this, it is not always easy to reconcile the righteousness of God with the justice of God. What is the righteousness of God? The righteousness of God is, in any situation, God is always going to do the right thing. Are we together? The, the, the Hebrew word it actually means like this. You, you analyze something, uh, you, you look at it carefully, you evaluate it, and after evaluating, you say, no, this meets quality control. This meets the grade. This meets the standard. This meets compliance. So when you look at God, He will always meet compliance. He will always meet the, the standard. He will always get grade A. That's what the righteousness of God is. And, and that also means that anytime you are in trouble, anytime you make a mistake, God is always going to treat you fairly and right at every situation. Amen? You will never get the short end of the stick with God. You always get the long stick. Justice of God is His ability to address evil. The justice of God is his ability to go into Egypt and bring out the people of Egypt and bring the plagues on the people of Egypt or Pharaoh. That's the justice of God. The justice of God is, is, is Achan takes something he's not supposed to take. The ground opens up and he's swallowed up. That's the justice of God. But here, Jeremiah is saying, God, but how can you be just if you, watch this, the wicked, you have planted them. You are the one who is helping them to take root. You are the one who helps them to succeed. God, how is that fair? Because I don't understand it. And that's the truth, brothers and sisters. That the most wicked per person, you can think of Pablo Escobar. <laughs> Plata o Plomo, if you watch the, the series. You can think of Adolf Hitler. You can think about Saddam Hussein. Muammar Gaddafi. Those people were successful. Those people achieved power because God made it happen for them. <laughs> so when you're praying, God... 
I want my boss to promote me. And the boss doesn't promote you, but promote somebody else. And your boss is still successful. God is allowing that to happen and making it happen for the boss. I know that's uncomfortable for you. It's also uncomfortable for me. It was uncomfortable for Jeremiah. But that's the God we serve. In the sense that the God we serve is that he is so fair to everyone. He loves everyone the same. That he's willing to give everybody a fair shot. Now, now, Pastor, I know that doesn't hit because a lot of times we always think of evil in the other people. We are never evil. I'm never evil. You know, I don't commit sin. You know, my wife is one who commits sin. You know, I'm never evil. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm the good one. <laughs> I don't make mistakes. So we always judge evil from their perspective. But we never judge evil from our perspective. Because if we did, we wouldn't talk like Jeremiah. Notice what Jeremiah says. He says in verse number four, Lord, kill them. That's what they deserve, to be killed. They don't deserve to live. I'm your prophet. Notice what he says in the first, in the first line. But you, O oh Lord, know me. You see me and test my heart toward you. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and set them apart for the devil. So, Jeremiah's like, God, actually, you know what? Uh, this is a good proposition because I, I never commit sin. Uh, I preach for you and... Uh, I'm good. I'm, I'm righteous. But, but look at what they're doing. They're the evil ones. So, God, because you don't know what to do, Dr. Ricky, let me suggest what you should do. Why don't you take them like animals that we slaughter at the temple and you do that to them? Can you imagine? That's how we do God sometimes. We instruct God on what he should do, how he should handle things. How he should take care of the situation. Because we think we know better than God. This week I learned that Donald Trump met a group of oil executives. Because if you know whether, I mean, depending on the political party you're running for, some are for the environment, some are not for the environment. <laughs> Typically the ones not for the environment are the ones who have oil companies, Right? The ones who want to do mining. So a group of them met Donald Trump and they said to Donald Trump, look, uh, Mr. To Be President, <laughs> we gave Joe Biden $400 million, but he has made it so much stricter for us. We cannot drill. We cannot grow our profits. It's much, much harder for us. So Donald Trump says, look, that's cool. <laughs> Don't worry about Joe Biden. If you give me a billion dollars for my campaign, I promise that when I'm president, I will not make any more laws to restrict you to do your business. You are free. In fact, you can set my policy for how I'm going to run the, 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 the environmental side of things. But you see, I'm glad that God is not like Donald Trump, who is only interested in the few, who is, not, who is only interested in the ones who give him money. But God is interested in everybody, even if they are good. Or they are bad. And the thing you need to tell yourself is, when you're struggling to make sense of why people are mistreating you, when you're struggling to make sense of why you're not progressing, when you're struggling to make sense of why you, you, you want to have a baby, but the baby's not coming, when you don't understand why people are passing you over, I want you to understand that as much as you are interested in your situation, God is interested in their situation. And that God wants to save them as much as he wants to save you. And for me, the righteousness of God is best understood in his delayed justice. <laughs> Did you get it? When God is delaying justice, it simply means he's saying, I have hope. I have belief. I have confidence that if I'm just patient with this person, they're going to turn to me. They're going to become one of my own. So when the justice of God lingers... Is God revealing his forgiving nature to other missteps? Brother Evil, we hate traffic in Jakarta. Anybody love traffic in Jakarta? Uh-uh. You don't like it, right? 
And some of you, what you guys do is you got your Google Maps and your Google Ways. You're always trying to find the, the, the little road that's going to help you to avoid traffic. I do it too. Now, because I don't have a job, I don't have an office hour, I can get to decide to go out when I want to. So I know that between 6 to 10, it's not a good time to be on the roads in Jakarta. And 3 to 8 p.m. is not a good time to be on the roads in Jakarta. So I plan my schedule. But even then, when I plan my schedule, I can still meet traffic on my way to wherever I'm trying to go. Remember, I don't have a job, right? <laughs> no office hour. But then it hit me. God is like traffic. God is like the roads in Jakarta because he wants to make sure that everybody gets a chance to use the roads and get to their destination. I understood God is like the roads and traffic in Jakarta because even when there are those traffic drivers, the Gojek drivers, you know how they drive crazy and they sometimes come out of there. I understood that God is like the, the, the traffic because he's saying even when people don't obey the rules like in Indonesia, I'm still kind. And I'm going to make sure that even though it's a traffic jam and though it's a, it's a, it's a rush hour, everybody's going to get to use the roads and get to their destination. And it amazes me how you guys drive in Jakarta. No accident there. That's the grace of God. And so when you're struggling, Lord, it's taking too long. Lord, I don't understand. Just remember the traffic in Jakarta. <laughs> That's the picture you need to keep in your mind. Because the Lord is not slow. As some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The brother you've not spoken to in a long time, the one you hate, God wants him to repent and be saved as well. The person who you thought deserves to go to jail, God wants him to be served as well. The person who you're not talking to, God wants them to be saved as well. The, 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 the people who fired you unfairly, God wants them to be saved as well. That's God's interest. But then, pastor, what's up, man? I'm still struggling with my situation. It's not making sense. And here is the disruptive idea. But we're talking about a disruptive God. This is a disruptive idea right here. To cope with God's delayed justice... You have to learn to run with the horses. Amen, nobody. <laughs> Notice what God tells Jeremiah after he complains everything. He says, look, if you have raced with men on foot and they have wearied you, how will you compete with the horses? Lord, I don't understand why. The wicked are prospering. Lord, I don't understand why I'm not, I'm not getting ahead. Lord, I don't understand why my kid had to die. Lord, I don't understand why I saved it up and I lost it all. Lord, I don't understand why there was a flood and it took away everything. God's answer is run with the horses. Wait a minute, Lord. Are you not going to comfort me? Are you not going to say, my son, I got your back? No, God is telling Jeremiah, I know you're struggling. I know it doesn't make sense. I know you want to quit, but run with the horses. Ah, but then you say, pastor, this is unfair. God is being unjust right here because how can a man run with horses? Horses are bigger and they are faster. But I learned that actually you can win against horses. This is not you saying bold. This is uh, more like you saying slow. <laughs> this is Hub Lu. I might be messing up the name. But in 2004, he beat a horse by five minutes. Because in, in Wales, they have horse men races. It's, it's called a marathon, but not really a marathon. It's about 22 kilometers. That's the distance. And it usually, it usually happens in the summer. And so it's 22 kilometers. It happens in the summer and it's hot. So horses can run fast, but when it's hot and it's long, they cannot continue. They don't have good endurance. 
Because when horses run, they cannot sweat. So they overheat. <laughs> but God has given human beings an X, I mean, a power, a power play. <laughs> when it gets hot, human beings sweat. And therefore, even though it's hot, they're sweating, it cools them down, and that is why human beings can keep running. So what God is saying, Jeremiah, is this. It's not about running fast. It's about enduring. And I've given you resources that when it gets hot, you're going to handle the heat. Well, I've given you resources. When you, you, it's hot, you're going to sweat, and you're going to be able to endure. The horses can't compete with you. You are bigger. You, you're not as big, but you are, you're going to endure. You're not as fast, but you're going to endure. You're not as strong, but you're going to endure. You may not know how to do it, but you can endure because you have it. You can run with the horses. You can make it. And that's what I want to tell somebody today. You can run with the horses. I don't know what it is that is making you tired, but you can run. I don't know who is distressing you and troubling you, but you can run. I don't know what disease is disturbing your body, but you can run. I don't know what discouragement is beating you up today, but you can run. I don't know what family problem you face today, but you can run. And not only run, win. Quickly, I want to give you four keys. It's not another sermon, I promise. I was talking to Pastor Sam the other day. Preach only one sermon, Pastor Henry. One sermon. Four keys to run with the horses, and we are done. Watch this. God entertains debate, but he sets direction. Jeremiah could talk to God and complain about his situation, and you can do the same thing. But after complaining, God told Jeremiah, run, brother. I have learned, being a dad now, that if it's something important, I cannot give my daughter a choice. I need to give direction. But if it's not important, I give her a choice. And so God is saying, Jeremiah, I talk to you, I listen to you, but as your father, this is so important for your faith. Can we go and start running? And you might be telling me, Pastor, I have figured it out. I know what to do. I have, I have the plan in place. But God is your father. And if he's giving you a direction, please don't debate. Just start running. Amen, somebody? Mm. The second thing, God's answers are sometimes difficult to handle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Come on now. God is not always going to answer your prayers in the way you wanted it. He may sometimes answer your prayer in a way you don't like it. But in that particular season, you will need to accept it. Notice what God tells Jeremiah. Jeremiah, mm, run with the horses, but also know. <coughs> <coughs> I lost my voice this week. So that's why I'm struggling. I'm running with the horses, y'all. Come on now. <coughs> For even your brothers and the house of your father, even they have dealt treacherously, treacherously with you. They are, full, they are in full cry after you. Do not believe them, though they speak friendly words to you. Basically, what God is telling Jeremiah, Jeremiah, it's been hard. It's going to get harder. In other words, God is telling Jeremiah, I am not going to take away the difficulty. <laughs> Come on now. In other words, sometimes you pray for the cancer to go away, but God is not going to take it away. Sometimes you pray for the marriage to be resolved, but it's not going to get resolved. Sometimes you pray for God to give you the breakthrough, but God is not going to give you a breakthrough. He's going to keep you in the state of difficulty. And his answer is going to be, keep on running. You know, in our house, we have one standing prayer request from my daughter. Every time I ask her, baby, what do you want me to pray for? Please pray for my math exam. Every time. I have math. And it's math week, man. Oh, my goodness. It, it's a struggle. But here's what I've learned. She's in grade four. She's going to go to grade five, but there's still math in grade five. There's math in grade six. There's math in grade seven. In other words, she's going to keep praying for math 
until she graduates from college. <laughs> and so for some of y'all, that is how life is going to be. I want a boss who can understand me, so I'm going to quit my job and go to the next boss. The next boss doesn't understand you either. <laughs> so sometimes the answers of God are difficult to handle, and his, his only response to you is like, hey, man, sorry, but this is what you have to go through. This is your season. This is your challenge, and let's go. The, four, the third thing, God uses difficulty to prepare you for your Jerusalem moment. See, what you need to understand is that when God told Jeremiah, run with the horses, that was one image. He was looking at an image of uh, a soldier, you know, running with the cavalry. You know, the cavalry come on horses, right? So that was the image, but now God uses a different image. He says like this, and if in a safe land you are so trusting, what will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? So, so you, you need to check this, the geography of Israel. You have the, the, the Sea of Galilee, and then the, the Jordan River runs down, and then it goes to the, to the, to the Dead Sea. So basically, between the, the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, there was a forest called the Thicket of the Jordan. Here, there were lions, Asiatic lions. There were hyenas. There were all kind of dangerous animals. In fact, it is the thicket of the Jordan where the children of Israel crossed when they were coming into the promised land. Why is God telling you uh, uh, this? It's because he lives in Anathos. In Anathos, he's almost been killed. But now, the, 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 the ministry for Jeremiah is to go to Jerusalem to tell them that Babylon is coming. In Jerusalem, he's going to meet priests. He's going to meet uh, kings. He's going to meet people who are not going to like him. And so God is telling Jeremiah, Jeremiah, man, Anathoth is a footman. Anathoth is a smooth place. But you're going to Jerusalem, the thicket of the Jordan. If you're quitting right now, how are you going to make it in Jerusalem? Don't you understand that every Christian has to go through Jerusalem? Don't you understand that Jesus himself, born in Galilee, had to go to Jerusalem? He was good in Jerusalem. Don't you understand that it is in Jerusalem Paul was sentenced? In other words, my brother and my sister, you and I, there is a Jerusalem moment coming. There's coming a moment when you and me are going to be tested. And God is saying, we have lions in Jerusalem. We have hyenas in Jerusalem. If you can't handle them there, now, how are you going to handle them there? So Jerusalem is coming. The real question is, how are you going to meet your Jerusalem moment? And God is so merciful. You can play Indra. <laughs> He's so good and merciful that he allows the difficulty to stay because the difficulty is your preparation for your Jerusalem moment. My brother, my sister, you're going to win when it's all over. It's been painful and difficult for you for a long time. I understand. You've been wanting to kick, to quit and give up on God. You've been wanting to give up on church. You, you don't want to serve as much as, as, as you used to before. But please just hold on. Jerusalem is coming. Where you are going to be tested. And God is going to be glorified because you're going to pass the test. Because you've been running with the horses. The last thing. It's over. It's over. What you need to understand is that God prepares tomorrow, today. What you need to understand is that God deals with the future today. Because he told Jeremiah, please read it, verse 7 to 13. He said, I will deal with the wicked. I'm going to send them away to Babylon. When you read it in your, in your Bibles, it's going to be in, in the future. It's going to seem like you're reading the, pres the, the future tense. But in the Hebrew language, there is what we call a prophetic perfect. Prophetic perfect is basically when a prophet of God like Jeremiah is speaking, he talks about a future event, but as if it's already done. You didn't get it. When a prophet in the Bible is speaking about God is going to do this, he's going to do that, he's never speaking of it as it's going to happen in the future. It's always spoken of in the past tense. It's, it's always spoken of as it's already done. Okay, it didn't hit. 
So when the Bible says, yes, it's coming back a second time, it's not something God is preparing to happen. It's already happened. Though it hasn't happened. So when God has spoken something, He's not saying, I need to get my money together. I need to get the team together. We need to have a meeting so we can decide. No, when God has told it to you, it's already done. So what he wanted Jeremiah to understand is don't think about the wicked. Don't worry about them. I've dealt with them already. I just need you to keep running with the horses. Victory is already yours. You are not fighting or running to victory. You are fighting from victory. So you're saying today, I want to run with the horses. I've been wanting to quit. I've been wanting to give up. Today I want to run with the horses. Anybody? I want to run with the horses. I want to run with the horses. Every head is bowed. Every set of eyes is closed as we pray. Mighty God, thank you because you are God and you're good. We want to run with the horses today because that is what you have asked us to do. There's a brother and a sister today who has wanted to give up and quit, but today they have been encouraged. No, I have to run with the horses. <laughs> There's no quit in God. So I just pray, Lord, for you to lift us up today. Help us to experience you in a meaningful way, Father. Give us your grace. Give us your power. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.